coming. Are you part of the just playing, Stoop? No, I'm Forrest Gill. Just run away, Forrest. Run, Forrest, run away, hurry. Get the place. <laughs> hurry up, man. Look out, Tommy, here we go. Run, Forrest, run. Run, Forrest. How iconic is that line? Run, Forrest, run. It's unbelievable. I'm talking to Steve Starkey. Welcome back. It's radio with TV's Tim Stack. I'm talking to Steve Starkey, a producer of that film, Forrest Gump, which is unbelievable when you think of the success of that film. You said you had a story about that bus. Yeah, what happened, you know, is that this is the, the bus to school. This is Forrest's first time getting on a bus to school. And he, of course, meets this little angel, Jenny, on, the, on that bus. Yeah. And I always said, I knew that scene would never get cut. And it wasn't because he meets Jenny on that bus. It's because of all the relatives and children that were on the bus playing the children. <laughs> For example, Bob Zemeckis' son, Alex, Alex was Alex. On Yes, the bus. that's right. My nephew, Ben, was on the bus. Don Burgess's son, the cinematographer's son, was on the bus. And Tom Hanks's daughter, Elizabeth, was on the Never bus. gonna cut that Never scene. Never gonna cut that <laughs> scene. You can't go home if you cut that scene. And wasn't the bus driver, what was her name? Siobhan? Yes. She was a friend of Mary Ellen. Yes. Yes. Another reason. Not gonna yes. cut that not scene. Cutting that scene. The wife's good friend is not gonna get cut out. <laughs> That's right. Um, so uh let's let's jump back to Lucas Land because I got to spend a little time there through our friend Dan, our mutual friend Danny Hahn. Um, who used to make Christmas gifts for Jane Bay for, for, for Lucasfilm. Yeah. So I met Jane Bay. Which so, is, by the way, where I met Danny Hahn. You met her up there? Yes. Wow. Yes. And oh, like boy. the, when was it? Like in the early 80s or late? We, we went there more like 94. Uh, although uh, I think I Danny was there earlier. Yeah. Like she That's brought us up. It. Yeah. Yeah, and That's then so through funny. serendipity, I was at a party at Peter's house, and Danny was there and said, hey, didn't we meet up at Lucas? Oh, my gosh. And so how did you get to Lucasland? Well, my dad, who, you know, I told my dad I wanted to change in my career from being an electrician. Oh, tell the story about the car wash. You met some guys at a car. It's in your book. You meet some guys at a car wash, and they say, like, you're too smart to be doing this. No, yeah, I didn't meet. It was the the gaffer. That's the it. chief lighting technician on a movie is called The Gaffer. And I was working for him as one of his slaves. And he said, he and the cameraman are, are sitting around having some coffee. He said, well, why, are you, why are you doing this work? I said, well, it's a job. I'm in, the, I'm in the film industry, you know? And they said, you're too smart to be doing You Find something else to do. You don't want to be pulling cable and turning on lights. Right. And right then I was starting to feel this urge to do something different. And my wife, who was working as a pastry chef in LA, she was having troubles in the kitchen at this high level restaurant. And we just said, you know, let's move back to Northern California. And so it's kind of the kick in the ass I needed to just reinvent yourself. And so I did. I went to Lucasfilm. But how did you even know there was a job there? Well, there wasn't really. You just showed up again and got on the bus? <laughs> kind of. No, when I, before I left Berkeley, I knew one guy in the yeah. Bay Area who was in the film industry. His name was Jimmy Bloom, and he was an assistant director. He had gone on to become an associate producer on Star Wars. Wow. The only guy, and he said, if you really want to get a job, go to LA. So I go down there. I'm doing this electrical. I'm coming back. I called Jimmy. I said, I did it for two years, Jimmy. I'm back. He said, well, why don't you have lunch with me? I'm working up at Lucasfilm. I had moved to Marin County like a bicycling distance to Lucasfilm. Oh I didn't have a second car to right. afford it. So I cycle over to Lucasfilm, meet with Jimmy, and he introduces me to the employees of Lucasfilm, which at that time was like five people. Right. It was Jane Bay as assistant, Chrissy the receptionist, Lucy the accountant, you know, and Howie the the projectionist. So I meet all these people and I give my number to Jane Bay. She calls me. She said, hey, we need, oh, they had a production assistant. Uh huh. He calls me and said, I need some help. We're setting up these houses for this, uh, for people coming from out of town for more American graffiti. Can you help me? Sure. What do you want me to do? Just meet the movers at these places and hook the telephones up, you know, whatever. And you knew how to do that. I knew how to do that. So I sat there and did that. And uh, 
he decided to leave Marin and go to LA. I was there. Jane said, let's hire him. And I got hired as the production assistant at Lucasfilm. Unbelievable. Yeah. At a hundred bucks a week. I had been making triple that as a, as a lighting technician. Right. So there I was. So the first time I go in with this check for $125 or something, Lucy says, she gives me the check, the accountant and says, now be sure to cash this. I said, well, of course I'm going to cash it as my paycheck. And she said, no, a lot of people keep these checks because George signs them and they uh, think his signature is more valuable than the check. <laughs> I said, well, not me. I need the money. <laughs> uh, speaking of that sort of thing, I have a framed check from a bet that I made with Bob Zemeckis that Forrest Gump would win the Academy Award. Really? Yes. And he said, no, it's not going to win. I said, I'll bet you a hundred bucks. And, and he I wrote had, me a check. He wrote me a check. And, it, and the note says, a bet's a bet. I love that. hundred bucks. Good for, uh, Bob. Good for Bob. So uh, you mentioned more American graffiti. Yeah. That's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> Nobody kidding. talks about that more film. More than American graffiti? No. Here's the thing. American <laughs> graffiti is my favorite George Lucas film. It's a classic. And, and trust me, I love Star Wars, but I'm not like a sci-fi yeah. lightsaber guy. Yeah. American Graffiti is a quintessential American film. And you love to imagine Ronnie Howard smoking pot with Harrison Ford. <laughs> That's why you really love it. Um, <laughs> but I also love more American Graffiti. Yeah. The only part, and this is what I'm getting, this is a roundabout way to get to your book dedication. So you dedicate your book to the guys from the birds. Yes. 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 Chris Holman and... Yes. Uh, okay. So... The only crazy part it was a telling line that it is. you want to be a rock and roll star. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the only crazy part of more American graffiti is that whole aspect with Doug Som. Yes. From the Flying Burrito Brothers, which Chris Hellman was in, I believe, yeah, after the birds. Right. See, I'm coming around yeah, you're circle coming around there. To it. So, but I love that movie. I think it 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 got dumped on. But I think it's a really great movie that people should watch. More American. Yeah, graffiti. it was a great follow up. These sequels are tricky. You got to feed what the audience wants, but you want to make it into something. Yes. And I thought they took the lives of those characters in the right direction. It was almost like before there was serialized television. Yeah. There was more American graffiti. Right. Like, because you end American graffiti on Charles Martin Smith uh, disappeared in Vietnam. Like, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, we see how it happened. Yeah. Uh, you don't still don't see how. And Miller... by the way, it was really good Vietnam footage shot in that movie. That footage was scary. Yeah, I mean, it just shot in the Central Valley. <laughs> um, okay, let's. Anyway, I'm thinking about that now. So, um, so another funny thing you say in your book is uh, when you're the new guy. Yes. You refer to the new guy, and I, quick story like. My first job ever, this call sheet, and I see on the call sheet, Timothy Stack, new. And I thought they were referring to me like I've never worked before, like I'm new in the industry. But your new guy was, you're the new guy. Yeah, well, I was always the new guy. I mean, that was the, that's the thing when you're trying to make your way in the film industry. No matter what job you take, you're always the new guy because yeah, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. You know, so when I go into the editing room on more American Graffiti, they shot that movie in three different formats, in 16 millimeter, in 35 millimeter, and then widescreen 35. Well, the, I was filing trims. Filing as an Explain what that is. Filing trims is when the editor makes a cut, he usually has these pieces on either end that he takes away because he puts in his perfect fitting piece of film. Well, and those, this is back in the days of real film. Real film, which kids today don't know about because they've never seen film. But in any case... You had to take those little trims and put them back in the rolls they came from. Oh. So now there's little itty bitty ones. There's bigger ones and other bigger ones. I didn't know the difference with these pieces of film. And you can't make a mistake. <laughs> yeah. And you got to put it back where it belongs because right. you might have, you might say, hey, you know that piece I cut out? Can you go get it for me? Yeah. And you go, yeah, just wait a minute. I'll be back. <laughs> Are you going to lunch? <laughs> you know, you I get, need a few minutes. You get on your bicycle and drive <laughs> yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to look for another job yeah um that's really interesting so so then what got you back to la well i through time up at lucasfilm 
you know, I've worked on that on Empire Strikes Back and then on Return of the Jedi, at the end of which I started doing these making of documentaries. Yes. I did a couple of them for uh, for Frank Marshall, at, including the one on Raiders and finally on Indiana Jones. So when I'm starting the documentary on Indiana Jones, uh, Stephen, who had just moved into this new building at Universal called Steven Amblin, Spielberg, Spielberg. Not all of us are on a first name basis. <laughs> okay. well, the other Steve, the okay. other SS. That's okay. SS. That is. He said, I want that documentary edited in my new building. So Frank calls up and said, hey, we want to move your operation from your little editing room up in Marin down to L.A. Said, Great. Sure. Can live come? Yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. We'll come to L.A. So that was my introduction, uh, you know, into into working at uh, at Amblin and with Spielberg. But what you go back to your specific question? I'm trying to remember your specific question was how did I how you got back down to L.A. Oh, how did I get into L.A.? Yeah. So that was what brought me to L.A. And then once there, uh, when I finished up the documentary, I was looking for a job uh, to continue my editing career. So Frank said, hey, they're starting up this movie called uh, Back to the Future. They're looking for a second editor. Why don't you go interview with the editor? So I interviewed was Artie Schmidt, the editor, Artie Schmidt, who, who we just, just lost. recently passed, was the editor. And he came to, you know, I interviewed and I could quickly tell I'd never edited a feature film. They're looking for a real guy. And I said, OK, I'm not going to get this, you know. So anyway, I go to Frank and he said, yeah, you're right. You didn't get the job. <laughs> but then Artie always said to me, I'm responsible for the fact you became a film producer because yeah. I turned you down on that movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. You're right, Artie. God bless him. Uh, so how did you how did you then go to the next? So you're, so, you're yeah, part so of this I, world. So then Frank says, okay, forget Back to the Future. We're starting this TV series, Amazing Stories. Gotcha. Interview there. All right, I go there. The producer comes to, to Frank and says, look, I just interviewed with Steve. He's great, but I don't want to hire him as an editor but I'd love to hire him as an associate producer because he knows everything about uh, post-production. What do you think he And say? also having been a, a lighting guy, you know about what I goes on on the set. But, but primarily the associate producer in television is responsible for finishing the shows, yes. editing, music, sound, getting it ready for broadcast. Yes. I'd done all that when I was on the Star Wars films. So he said, you think he'd want to do that? And so Frank calls me in the office and he says, Tell me what your five-year plan is. And I said, <laughs> I got a five-minute plan. I got a five-minute plan. I said, in five years, I want to be an associate producer on one of your movies. He said, really? Okay. I tell you what, I got a starting job for you then. Over on Amazing Stories, they need an associate producer. Take the job. I said, well, okay. Okay. So I took the job. I was offered, took the job. And I immediately had like PT. I was terrified. Well, I thought we should I, we should refresh people's memory of that show. How are we doing on time? Are we all right? Um, Amazing Stories was a show created by George Lucas. And no, Steven. by no, by Spielberg, by Spielberg. Yes. Lucas was one of the directors they brought in. No, Spielberg. No, Spielberg directed the opening episode as well as executive producing the entire anthology. But all these directors, yes, very famous well, directors, like Burt Reynolds, yeah. Clint Eastwood, Martin Scorsese, all came in and directed episodes as a favor to Steven. Right. But that job handling those guys was huge, huge. And the pressure, because people don't realize in the film world, the director is it. He oh, is yeah. the field marshal. He's the Fuhrer. He's all of that stuff. So to you're working with Scorsese and then all of a sudden you're with Clint Eastwood. This is a, this is the making a movie in television. Yes. So you're working with film direct, not like television where writers are in control or producers here. Directors are contr in control and big directors, big directors who are used to big budgets, not TV yeah. budgets. Also that show, cause it was an anthology show. It's not, you're not back in the home set of the kitchen to no. shoot there where everybody knows it. It's a new set every, every week. week. Just like Johnny Bago. Just like Johnny Bago. <laughs> it all comes back. And on that note, <laughs> people want to watch Johnny Bago. All six episodes are on YouTube. They should. 
They're, they're oh, really clever. They're that, great. A show that was meant for modern day serialized been, television. It should have been on HBO. We could have done whatever we wanted. It was not built for CBS. I think it was on CBS. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was not built for CBS. Anyway, let's take another break. I'm talking to Steve Starkey. He's the writer of, I'm holding it up again, Breaking and Entering, The Education of a Film Producer. Right there, that's a really good picture of you. Yeah. Who drew that picture? Doug Chang. Oh, man. Actually, I'll tell you more about that after the break. Okay, let's take a break. And then, and also the book has great pictures inside. Yeah. Too. So, okay, we'll take a break. You're listening to It's Radio with TV's Tim Stack. Okay, go ahead. 